Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be doing something on the sciences uh, in a roundabout way. It's a special kind of groupthink in large numbers. This article got my attention, and especially with everything that's going on these days, it, um, it moved up on my list of things I mark. It's uh, from Big Think. Why large groups of people often come to the same conclusions? By, I uh, hope I can give credit to Robbie Berman. I don't see a link here for an audio version, which is funny. When I first started thinking up to do my channel and I had outlines and notes, um, I always said, oh, I want to do, just read some of these articles. They're so interesting. And then all of a sudden, I started noticing on these sites, they have a link to an audio version, which is probably better than me, by the way, if that's your thing. But this one doesn't. Again, it's by Robbie Berman on the Big Think link. I'll put it in the description, as I always do. One of the points is large groups of people everywhere tend to come to the same conclusions. In small groups, there is much wider diversity of ideas. The mechanics of large group make some ideas practically inevitable. So usually I read it word for word, and so I'll stop here and there. And at the end, I give a little bit of my thoughts on uh, the article in general. But this one up front is really because, you know, what's going on with this fucking political divide and the storm in the capital, it can get crazy. So I'll begin. People make sense of the world by organizing things into categories and naming them. These are circles. That's a tree. Those are rocks. In one way, we tame our world. That's a weird correspondence between different cultures, though. Even though we come from different places and very different circumstances, cultures everywhere develop largely the same categorizations. But this raises a big a scientific puzzle, says Damon Centola of the University of Pennsylvania. If people are so different, why do anthropologists find the same categories? For instance, shapes, colors, and emotions arising independently in many different cultures. Where do these categories come from, and why is there so much similarity across independent populations? And these are always type of questions that I've always thought of here and there, you know, when you delve into these type of social things, and I'll continue. Centola is the senior investigator of a new study in the journal Nature Communications from the Network Dynamics Group, NDC, at the Annenberg School for Communication that explores how such categorization happens. Categorization. God, I murdered a fucking language. That's what you get from a wise-ass pothead from Brooklyn. Some have theorized that these categories are innate, pre-wired in our brains. But the study says, nope, its authors hypothesize that, that it has more to do with the dynamics of large groups or networks. The grouping game. The research tested their theory with 1,480 people playing an online grouping game via Amazon's Mechanical Turk platform. By the way, I've used Amazon Mechanical Turk platform to make some money. Uh, I wrote like articles, reviews for games, and little things like that. Guess who didn't turn off their fucking phone thing? So Amazon Mechanical Turk, it's like, uh, you know, you could search for people's uh, um, rating on Google and do certain tests that you can make pennies on, sometimes a couple of dollars, and here and there you can make, uh, you know, 12 bucks here and there. It depends, because you have to get certifications like I had to get an editor and go up the ladder on this writing thing. Anyway, the individuals were paired with another participant or made member of a group of 6, 8, 24, or 50 people. Each pair group were tasked with categorizing the symbols shown above and they could see each other's answers. So they show a graph. By the way, there's lots of links in the article. Made me lose my place. The small groups came up with widely divergent categories. The entire experiment produced nearly 5,000 category suggestions, while the large groups, the larger group, 
came up with categorization systems that were virtually identical to each other. Says Santola, even though we predicted it, I was nevertheless stunned to see it really happen. This result changes many long-held ideas about culture and how it forms. Nor was this unanim unanimity <laughs> Uh, unanimity, a matter of having teamed up like-minded individuals. If I assign an individual to a small group, says lead author Douglas Gilbiolt, they, they are much more likely to arrive at a category system that is very idiosyncratic and specific to them. But if I assign that same individual to a large group, I can predict the category system that will end up creating, that they will end up creating regardless of what every unique viewpoint that person happens to bring to the table. Now, that's fascinating for me as someone who has been obsessed with uh, psychology, neurology, blah, blah, blah. I've said it before. Why this happens. Now, they show a graph. There's an image here. Uh, the striking results of the experiment correspond to a previous study done by the NDC that investigated tipping points for people's behavior in networks. That study concluded that after an idea enters a discussion among a large network of people, it can gain irresistible traction by popping up again and again in enough individuals' conversations. In networks of 50 people or more, such ideas eventually reach critical mass and become a prevailing opinion. Uh-oh. That's... okay. The same phenomenon does not happen often enough within a smaller network where fewer interactions offer an idea less of an opportunity to take root or take hold. I'm changing the fucking article. <laughs> Beyond categories. The study's finding raises an interesting practical possibility. Would categorization-related decisions made by large groups be less likely to fall prey to members' individual biases? With this question in mind, the researchers are currently looking into content moderation on Facebook and Twitter. They're investigating whether the platforms would be wiser when categorizing content as free speech or hate speech if large groups were making these decisions instead of lone individuals working at these companies. Pretty interesting in today's climate, right? What's going on? Similarly, they're also exploring the possibility that large networks of doctors and healthcare professionals might be better at making diagnosis that would avoid biases such as racism or sexism that could cloud the judgment of individual practitioners. Many of the worst social problems reappear in every culture, notes Sintola, which leads some to believe that these problems are intrinsic, intrinsic to the human condition. Our research shows that these problems are intrinsic to the social experiences humans have, not necessarily the humans themselves. If we can alter that social experience, we can change the way people organize things and address some of the world's greatest problems. Now, there's a little bit of nuance in here, and it almost flips on itself the way my brain was working, and it's starting to say that you could cut out biases and stuff by using the large groups. And it's a weird dynamic, in my opinion. I get fascinated by this. There's always been this um, fascination with like people will do in large groups and how you get swept up in the moment. And this is uh, so many layers to people's behavior. And it's good to see studies like this coming out, especially like I said, and probably why. When was this put out? Like, when was it? When was this made? January 14, 2021. Okay, so. It recently came to my attention, which is why I used it like three days ago. You could tell it's clickbait in a way because it's what's going on, right? We got uh, this political unrest, storming the Capitol, uh, you know, the president saying that this is a lie, it's a fraud, the election was stolen, and he'll repeat things like uh, 75 million people voted for me the most ever, but what about Biden? And all those are fake. It's just... And it is prevailing over Facebook and Twitter, and then they start banning him. And here we go, cancel culture. And I don't, I don't kind of go with it. Although you can be against cancel culture, but still want a psychopath 
uh, taken off the fucking network or air or whatever your platform and station, whatever we're calling it these fucking days. So I don't see the uh, big hysteria about this, um, uh, some of the arguments I see. But looking at it with this um, study, and it's saying confirms the existence of... It's just a little weird. I. It, it makes me think, like, what it says at the end, like, could we alter our social experience? Can we change the way people organize things and address some of the world's greatest problems? And I've always had this base thing of, if we taught children breathing and meditation exercises, and as their developmental stages change, we alter our teaching of them. And I'm talking about not giving them our bias bullshit. You don't teach them our religion or something that you believe. Letting them explore the connection between their breathing and their thoughts and this untamed craziness we have going on in our brains that we're still trying to figure out. I think that's a great foundation for solving some of these problems. You create these natural patterns of buffers of um, uh, at least getting a little bit, what do they call it, like in some of the, like an inoculation to nonsense. You're, you're training your body to be more calm and focused and reasonable. That doesn't mean we're not going to all suffer the same conditions that we do as humans in life, but it fascinates me that a big, large group, they, it's just you can take the people out and switch them around and it changes everything. Keep doing these studies. I will never tire of things like this. And even, even though it's not really the science, well, maybe this is a, uh, yeah, you know, you're doing research and studies. And there are links here. So you can go to actual uh, parts of the study, uh, lots of graphs. It's a, you know, here and there I find things that uh, I'll move up on my list. I have things from like 2016 or 2017 that have fascinated me that I've put on years later. But this seemed timely. It seemed like something to uh, at least get out there. Maybe I'll look for more things like this. I think I did something a couple of weeks ago. Well, the way I put things out, I apologize, but I've been focusing on writing and role-playing. So I've kind of went down to two videos a week putting out. But I will look back and go, wow, this article's old, and but it makes sense now. It kind of fits, and that's how I'll jumble things around. In any case, this is a interesting time we're in. This is looking at this as a, um, a, a warning signal and maybe a, uh, a beacon of hope for understanding. You know, how can we um, turn this type of behavior, these patterns we have, this, like some say, or they thought was innate and they're looking at it. How do we use this to our advantage? If we learn more about it, get to the nitty gritty, the only intricacies and the nuances of it, of this, we could have a, an amazing society, culture, and it could spread worldwide. And that would be my pie in the sky dream. Like if you combine the Buddhist and the American culture and you take the best of everything and you kind of blend them. And then you filter out the junk, all the fucking bullshit that doesn't work. And I'm not talking about stopping belief and stuff, but the dogmatic adhering to them is what really gets me. It's what gives people the idea like um, they don't know the difference between them saying, oh, I don't I, I I think abortion is bad and I wouldn't I would tell my wife not to do it or something. And the difference between writing a law that prevents people from doing it. Anyway, I'm rambling. This is a uh, uh, a topic that I really can get into. So once again, this is why large groups of people often come to the same conclusions. I think the actual title was "People Make Decisions Differently in Large Groups." It's from the Big Think website and it's by Robbie Berman. Sometimes you don't get to see the names in some articles and I do a little fucking digging I can't find but this one at least I can and I've always been fascinated with this 
group think, these large groups, and how people can get swept up in it. Anyway, check out the article instead of my ramblings. I think it's interesting. You'll find some links to some of the uh, studies they did and maybe make better understanding of some of these graphs because I'm not that fucking good at them. And my, you know, uh, my brain's a little crazy. Everybody stay safe. This is a crazy time. I hope everybody does well. My best to you and yours. And I hope everybody does well, even people that I might disagree with. Take care. Until next time. Bye-bye.